Hello, I'm Deb Bossinger from the Leesburg Public Library. We are so excited to, to host Michael Togas today. First of all, I'm going to stop there. Did you know the pronunciation of his name is Michael Togas? Now I know. <laughs> I had to ask. This program is a partnership between Florida Humanities and the Leesburg Public Library. Funding for this program was provided by Florida Humanities and sponsored in part by the State of Florida Department of State, Division of Arts and Culture, and the Florida Council on Arts and Culture. I'd like to introduce you to Michael Togas. He is a New York Times bestselling author and co-author of 30 books for adults and seven for children and young adults. Among his bestsellers are The Finest Hours, which is also a Disney motion pictures version, which opened in 45 countries in January, 2016. Fatal Forecast, Overboard, King Philip's War, and There's a Porcupine in My Outhouse, The Vermont Misadventures of a Mountain Man Wannabe. Togus lectures across the country on each of his book topics. He also offers leadership, inspirational programs for business groups, and has spoken to companies and organizations such as General Dynamics, Raytheon, Massachusetts School Library Association, New York University Surgeons Roundtable, and many more. It is with great pleasure that we introduce Michael Togas. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. And Deb, thank you for all your hard work putting this together. Hi, everyone. Um, Above and Beyond was a, a challenging book for me. Uh, but not for the usual reasons. Normally with the other books, it's you know so labor intensive to, to find all the research material and interview all the people. But with the Cuban Missile Crisis, it was the opposite. There's so much information, a lot of it um, recently declassified CIA information that the, the challenge was what to leave in and what to leave out. And, and I always think a, a good book is as much what to leave out. If you try to cram everything in, you're gonna lose the, the reader. Or if you try to cram every character in, uh, you won't care as much about the, the important ones. So this, uh, this story, the, the peak of the story occurs on the uh, a day called Black Saturday. And our, our slides are gonna lead up to that. Um, and so the first two slides, we'll talk about some of the, the main characters and a little bit of the background leading up to the Cuban Missile Crisis. So one of the, one of the stars of this particular book is the U-2 spy plane. And this is a really unusual plane in that it can fly 13 miles above the Earth. So you know, no Soviet fighter jets could reach it. It's so high up. But we learned the hard way that Soviet surface to air missiles could. Um, you probably remember the story about Gary Powers being shot down over Russia. And um, this, this story that I'll be telling you is, is about another shoot down as well, but that almost nobody knows about. But the, these planes were really a, a technological marvel. I call them um, like a glider on steroids. So very lightweight to get up that high, but it does have jet power. And uh, a very temperamental aircraft, no two flew exactly alike. So you had to be the, the best of the best in terms of pilots. And this one, this pilot was one of the best of the best, Steve Heiser, and he was from Florida, uh, Appalachicola. And Steve was the one who actually discovered the missiles in Cuba. I, I like this particular picture of him because he's got on the, the pressure suit. And one issue with the U-2 spy plane is if the cockpit loses air pressure, you'll be dead within 90 seconds. You're, you're blood will literally begin to boil. But this pressure suit was meant to activate, mimic the air pressure on Earth and, and keep the pilot alive. And there, there's a funny story in the book that um, the pilots, when they were taken to get you know, fitted for the pressure suits, they were flown into Boston, Mass. I live outside of Boston in the uh, warm weather months. And then they were taken to Worcester, Mass. 
to a bra and girdle factory and then taken down into the basement. A little black door opens up to a, a one tiny room with a hanging light bulb. And there was a tailor who, who measured the pilots there in this super secret location. And then they came back the next day and the pressure suit were done, made by the, the women who were making the, the bras and the girdles. So uh, hidden in the, the basement was this top secret location that the pilots all had to go to. So with the Cuban Missile Crisis, you know, the stakes couldn't be higher because you have the two nuclear superpowers. And, you know, I was like the average person before tackling this book. I knew a little bit about the Cuban Missile Crisis, but everything I read was a, a revelation, um, including just how many nuclear weapons we and Russians had from intercontinental ballistic missiles to battlefield nuclear weapons, it ran the gamut. It's, it's really frightening. So leading up to the Cuban Missile Crisis was Castro overthrowing Batista in 1959. And then we tried to overthrow Castro and it was a terrible failure. And the Bay of Pigs plan, even though it was hatched by Eisenhower, it was executed by Kennedy and he made a series of, of mistakes, and it was a disaster. But I do think looking back, and this is just my opinion, that it was a blessing in disguise in some ways because Kennedy did learn from those mistakes, and he was determined not to make the same ones during the Cuban Missile Crisis. So then you had the Soviets pouring in to, to build up their military presence there. And then Steve Heiser got that first photograph from a U-2 of a, of a uh, medium range ballistic missile in Cuba. So I thought, you know, Khrushchev plays a prominent role in this story and I thought he's gonna be this mercurial character. Uh, but I came away with a different sense about him that, that he was a really shrewd man. He, he fought in World War II. And one of the insights I got was through his son, Sergei Khrushchev, who was old enough at the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis to remember having conversations with his father. And interestingly enough, he was, uh, Sergei Khrushchev was living in Rhode Island when I interviewed him. Um, I think he's a US citizen now, what an odd turn of events. So some of the conversations that he told me about his father's reactions to different parts during the crisis, I put in the book above and beyond because you get an inside look at what was happening with Khrushchev and inside the Kremlin. Kennedy said that, you know, not only are the missiles a, uh, a military threat, but he said they're a political one. He said, uh, I'll be impeached if I don't get those out of there. And I think he was right on that. I don't think the American people would have stood for having these missiles just 90 miles off of, um, off of Florida. So um, there were, for him, there were, were two issues and, and that was his objective. The missiles had to go one way or the other. So as I was researching the book, again, I'm learning just like the average history buff is. And I, I didn't realize what a big island Cuba is over 700 miles across. I never knew where our Guantanamo Bay was located. Um, so I'm trying to educate the reader as I go along, but not get into such nitty gritty details that you lose the, the action and the tension of the story. And now I wanna introduce you to the, the four or five main characters. The first one is uh, Lieutenant Jerry McElmoyle. He was the youngest of the U-2 pilots selected to fly over Cuba to get more intelligence. And Jerry, I was able to locate, he was in his 80s and I found him in, in Venice, Florida. And um, boy, he was a treasure trove of information and just a wonderful uh, human being to work with because he would answer even the the most lame questions on my part and walk me through and really give me a sense of what it was like 
to fly in a U-2 and what it was like to put your life on the line during this, this crisis. And Jerry explained to me that, that his boss was Major Rudy Anderson that you see here. And Rudy was a, an interesting character because even though he fought in the Korean War, he, uh, you know, deep inside, he was a pacifist. He did not want to kill anybody. So he was always volunteering for reconnaissance flights. And later, after that war ended, the CIA knew about uh, his good piloting skills and recruited him into the U-2 spy plane program because, you, you know, a lot of the pilots washed out. It's just too tough because you're up there flying all alone. There's no co-pilot. Oftentimes it's for six, seven hours at a time. And again, the aircrafts are, are tricky to fly. Um, the pilots called them uh, the Dragon Lady. That's what they called the U-2 because they never quite knew how it was going to react. Another pilot we're going to follow is Chuck Maltzby. He also fought in the Korean War, but he was shot down by the Chinese and survived three years of living in a basically an earthen hole where he was kept prisoner. And then during a POW exchange, he was released. Had I been in his shoes, I would have left the Air Force, never got into a plane again, so I wouldn't be shot down. But he re-upped. And um, again, a very good pilot. He was able to qualify for the U-2 program and learn how to fly the, the Dragon Lady. So he's going to play a role in this story as well. And then finally, now I knew President Kennedy would be a major player in the book, but I didn't know to what extent until I realized that he secretly audio recorded every single meeting he had on the Cuban Missile Crisis. And he never told the people in the room that they were being recorded. So those tapes are this treasure trove of history and I found that listening to the tapes could be confusing. I didn't know who was saying what, except for Kennedy himself or Bobby, because they had that strong Boston accent. But um, there is a book and it's called The Kennedy Tapes. It's a big, thick book. You know, it's probably like three inches thick, but it has all their meetings on the Cuban Missile Crisis, who's saying what. And so I took the most heated parts of the debate and put them in above and beyond. So you know what they're thinking, what they're planning. And in some cases, you know, it's, it's literally the fate of mankind is in their hands. So as I mentioned earlier, the crisis begins October 14th, 1962, but the film from the U-2s is old fashioned and it needed to be developed. So that was flown from Florida where the U-2 pilots flew out of. They flew out of McCoy Airfield at Orlando. There was no Disney World, of course. And the film was developed up in Washington, DC. And then when they realized on one picture, there was a, a nuclear missile, they, they told Kennedy during his breakfast. And I always wondered, you know, what would be his first question? And I, and I do a version of this program for business groups about I call the, the program 14 Steps to Strategic Decision Making. In other words, how did Kennedy pull this whole thing off to get what he wanted without a major loss of life? And so I wondered, okay, what would his first question be? I thought it might be, you know, how many missiles or where are they? Um, but instead he asked, are you sure? Is the, is the premise correct? Because he said, I don't see missiles in this picture. And the head of the National Photographic Center told him, well, Mr. President, we back at the lab have the ability to enhance those photographs and blow them up. And all of our experts are in 100% agreement that we're looking at a uh, medium range ballistic missile. Uh, this was also a super secret location. Um, this one was over a used car dealership in Washington, D.C. So, you know, the CIA had its bases covered of keeping these, anything to do with the U-2 program, you know, under wraps. Uh, many people had never seen a U-2. 
at that point, except the pilots and the creators. So, you know, the, the most important question is his first or second one, which is, when will the missiles be operational? In other words, how much time do I have to get them out of there? Because once they're operational, the Soviets can just press a button and they can launch. And the estimate that he was given was between, Mr. President, we think between 10 and 14 days, the warheads will be on the missiles and they'll be ready to launch. And that turned out to be a pretty good guess. Um, so that gives him at least a framework of when the, the missiles have to go, because that, that's his ironclad goal and really crucial to any successful um, steps in decision making is, yeah, you can have an ironclad goal, but do not have an ironclad plan. Make sure your plan is flexible, subject to change, make, make sure you're willing to reverse course if need be. And, and Kennedy does all these things, much, much to the uh, frustration of the military advisors. So his second question is in step is equally important, who's gonna be my advisors? And this could be used by any of us if we have a major decision. You always wanna bounce it off some people whose opinions you really trust. So he set up the XCOM of the National Security Council and that stands for executive committee. And you know, it didn't just have the usual suspects like the head of the CIA, but he had the head of the treasury there. And I'm thinking, why would he do that? Uh, what's the treasury got to do with it? But it, it wasn't the treasury, it was the man who ran the treasury was really bright and Kennedy wanted the best and the brightest minds. He did not want to surround himself with yes men. And, and I think in the polarization of politics today, that's the, the problem we're seeing by the two major parties is they're surrounded by people that are giving them the advice they want to hear. So you're not getting all, all perspectives, but, but Kennedy was smart enough to leave some people in that room who were going to disagree with them. And so here they are meeting. Uh, little do they know, there's two microphones uh, back in the bookcases there recording everything they said. Uh, Bobby Kennedy standing up. He probably knew about the microphones because he was the president's closest advisor. You see LBJ sitting down across from the, the uh, center of the screen. And so his first decision, and by the way, at that first meeting, if you read the transcripts, it's pretty clear that it's almost unanimous that the decision is we're gonna attack Cuba and we're gonna do airstrikes on the nuclear facilities and if there's any surface to air missiles. So they ask for more intelligence and the next pilot to go up in a U-2 is, is Major Rudy Anderson. And so when he comes back and his film is analyzed, and by the way, they the Soviets knew we were doing these overflights because they could track U-2s on their radar, um, but they did not have authorization from Khrushchev to shoot them down. So when Rudy landed and his film was examined, it was more bad news for the president. Um, not only are there nuclear missiles in San Cristobal, there's some other sites as well. And the Soviets have installed surface to air missiles, which means these U-2s could be shot down if the Soviets so choose. Because they're up there without any weapons, um, very little evasive, uh, uh, technology on board to, to escape. And that, you know, the U-2 was created over a, a very short period, like three or four years from start to finish for this incredible invention. But one of the more practical um, solutions to an issue was the wings were so long, they scraped on the ground in the early trials. So they came up with a, a simple solution put what they called pogo sticks under the wings. Soon as the aircraft was airborne, these were not fixed to the wings, they just fall away. So it kept the aerodynamics to the airplane. 
And then when the airplane landed on the ground, some of the fuel had been used so the wings were lighter and they wouldn't scrape. So there are a lot of these, we talk about the invention of the U-2, but some simple simple things like, like pogo sticks. Uh, later, you'll hear me mention a simple thing like a rear view mirror in the cockpit. So Kennedy has the best Air Force pilots. He does not want the CIA involved because there are some CIA pilots. Uh, he says, no, I want the Air Force. Maybe because he felt he got burned during the, the Bay of Pigs by the CIA. I'm not sure, but he's very adamant. I want Air Force pilots. And so they group down in Orlando. There's 10 or 11 of them. It takes them about 40 minutes to get over Cuba, and then they shoot their targets with their cameras. And by the way, they, they had to do it on days that the weather was clear because the cameras could not pierce cloud cover. There's a, uh, a funny story behind this picture. There's Kennedy with the Soviet foreign minister and the Soviet ambassador to the UN. And the topic of Cuba comes up and they're discussing it. And at this point, you know, Kennedy knows about the the nuclear weapons there, but they say to him, Mr. President, yes, our military's in Cuba because you did the Bay of Pigs, but we can assure you there's no nuclear weapons. And as soon as the meeting was over, Kennedy goes to Bobby. It's all I could do not to walk to my desk, pull out the photos and shove it under their noses. I can't believe they lied to me in the Oval Office. Uh, but he didn't want to tip his hand because he hasn't decided what he's going to do. It looks in the early two days of the crisis that he's going to go with the airstrikes, surprise airstrikes. But as time goes by, he's starting to think, this may be the first step to World War III. I think the Russians are not going to sit idly by if I destroy their surface air missile sites and nuclear sites. Um, so he's one of the more calmer heads at the meetings thinking, the next steps, where is this whole thing going to lead? And by the way, he's in his favorite rocker because his, his back was always killing him. Um, it was an injury was exasperated during his PT-109 incident in World War II. And he did take a lot of painkillers, but he was always lucid during the meetings, um, always in full control. So one of the people at the the meetings with General Curtis LeMay. So he's head of both the Air Force and Strategic Air Command, where you know our Air Force has nuclear weapons aloft. And LeMay and the president get in a number of uh, heated exchanges, um, so much so it was borderline insubordination. And had I been in Kennedy's shoes, I would have kicked him out. But um, he keeps him in because he wants this differing opinion. And at one time, LeMay goes to the president, uh, you're in a bad fix. And the president goes, what did you just say? And LeMay goes, I said, you're in a bad fix. And then Kennedy diffuses the tension by going, well, you're in it with me. You know, we're on the same side, uh, but you never know it from some of the exchanges. Uh, another time LeMay says, um, uh, what you're doing is worse than the appeasement at Munich. It's going to look really weak. Uh, so I, I put those exchanges in the book because you're on the edge of your seat wondering what's going to happen with these two men going at it and who's going to win the argument to decide what we do. LeMay didn't seem to be too concerned about World War III or nuclear war for that matter. And you'll read in the book why he, he wasn't all that concerned. I didn't agree with him, but I had to put his view in the book. So Kennedy frustrates all the, the uh, heads of the various military branches by going with a blockade. And some people say that'll never work. And he says, yeah, it may not, but it gives me more options. It's a first step. But he does say to LeMay, if they shoot down one of our U-2s, I give you permission to then go in and wipe out that surface air missile site. And he goes on and addresses the country. Uh, his big concern privately is that he's going to lose control over the situation. 
And interestingly enough, that's exactly what Sergei Khrushchev told me that his father's big fear was. He, he worded it a little different, but he said, my father's fear was that someone on the ground in Cuba would have a, a different agenda than me and we'd be into nuclear war without my being the one to initiate the action. And we were on DEFCON too, the highest level you could be short of war. So he addresses the country, he does it in a measured tone and uh, you could bring this up on YouTube. But um, it was interesting, even though he's doing it, you know, without panicking people. One woman, I, I did a program in Central Florida last year, and she said, I was a little girl. And as soon as the president's address was all over, my father went to the backyard and started digging a bomb shelter. So that's how concerned people were. And then another woman, at the, it was ac actually at the same presentation, she said, I was also a little girl. She said, I went to school the next day. And at the end of the day, the teacher goes, there will be no homework tomorrow because, or tonight, because there may not be a tomorrow. So people were anxious. There wasn't panic, but they were very anxious. And the headlines the day after Kennedy spoke you know, probably fueled that anxiety because the Russians said what Kennedy has done is illegal and it's putting us uh, towards nuclear war. So, you know, anybody that, that read the newspaper the next day, how could you help being alarmed? So again, Kennedy's thinking if the blockade doesn't get the missiles out, I'm, I'm gonna have to take military action. So. He wants more overflights for intelligence gathering than just the U-2. So now he authorizes Navy crusaders to go over Cuba and, and they fly at a low level. You know, they're just above treetop range and they're going at 500 miles per hour, but the cameras are quite sophisticated and they came back with some good pictures. Um, this is one that they took and you could see in that big tent there um, that is um, uh, the nuclear missile inside. We knew because of that, we could measure to the exact inch of how big that tent was. And we knew based on that compared to the May Day parades in Moscow, the length of their missiles. When I, I showed this recently, um, someone asked me, that looks like snow on top of the tent and on the ground. I said, it's definitely not snow, but it may be just the way the photo came out. Um, maybe it's a sandy area and maybe they painted the tops of the trucks to, and the top of the tent to blend in with the sand. I'm, I'm not sure, but definitely not snow down in Cuba. Probably had to do with the, the way the uh, photography was taken. So at the UN, it's Adlai Stevenson who's got to tell the world why we're doing this blockade. And he brings out the um, proof. And um, it's unsure if the, the Soviet foreign minister knew about the missiles or not, because he seems to be caught off guard. And there's a, again, I put it in the book, a heated exchange between Stevenson and the Soviet ambassador. Um, and, you know, the Soviet ambassador doesn't give an answer. And Stevenson says, I'm prepared to wait here until hell freezes over to get an answer about what you're doing. And uh, so the, now the world knows what's going on and, and why the US has imposed this quarantine to stop any Soviet ships or subs. So now it's Jerry's turn to fly. And this is a really fascinating part of the story. So I, I always, I've done so many nonfiction books, I've learned open it up with a bang to grab the readers because I read a book a week and if it doesn't pull me in in the first chapter, I just move on. There's too many good books to read. So I open it up with Jerry's story because it's quite unusual. He said, um, so I was tasked to fly the length of Cuba and photograph four targets. And he said, I was not too far from Guantanamo Bay over Bonnier's Cuba when in my rear view mirror, I could see a, a contrail 
coming up um, from the ground. And it's a surface to air missile. And I said, what did you do? And he said, I thought the missile was off course. So I did what I'm trained to do and that's take pictures. So I banked the plane, reactivated the camera and up comes that contrail and one other following behind it. And he said, then I got the starburst on film. And I said, did it look like this? And he said, maybe when it first blows up, but he said, after that, he said, shrapnel comes out in all directions so that hopefully one piece of shrapnel would hit a U-2 by the Russians. And because the U-2 is such a lightweight aircraft, that one piece of shrapnel might be enough to bring it down. But he said that these exploded probably an eighth of a mile to a quarter mile away. I got it on film and, and he said, I got the hell out of there. <laughs> and he lands in Florida and of course the CIA and the Air Force debrief him and he, he tells them what happens. And then later he tells his boss, Major Rudy Anderson. And um, the, more, the most interesting part of his story is he said the next day he's walking out to a U-2, he's on the tarmac of McCoy Airfield. And he says, someone behind him, and Jerry's last name is Macklemore, somebody behind him goes, Macklemore. And Jerry turns around and he, he sees the three stars on this general's shoulder and he goes, yes, sir. He doesn't know who the general is. And this general goes, I just flew down from Washington. We've examined your film and there was nothing on it. So we destroyed it. And Jerry goes, sir, I'm positive I got the starbursts and the contrails on film. And the general goes, you did not. And we destroyed your intelligence report because you're mistaken. And Jerry goes again, sir, I'm positive. And finally, the general goes, do you understand what I'm telling you? In other words, zip it up, uh, keep this quiet, and your intelligence report has been destroyed. Jerry always thought it was somebody in the Kennedy administration who put the kibosh on this information, not wanting it to get to Kennedy. I always thought it was somebody, maybe Curtis LeMay, not wanting it to get to Kennedy because Kennedy may stop the overflights and, and LeMay and the rest of the military need that information for the bombing runs and a potential invasion of the island. But we'll never know who because Jerry, who became a Brigadier General, you know, he he had quite a career in the Air Force. Um, he never found out who squashed what happened to him. And it never came up on the Kennedy uh, tape recordings. So the president didn't know. So two days after Jerry's fired upon is, is really the, the peak of this whole crisis. It's called Black Saturday uh, because three more incidents happens that, that basically have us a whisker away from, from nuclear war. And so I'll tell you about two in full detail, but the third or the middle one, I'm gonna leave you hanging because I want there to be, there's many surprises in the book, but this is a, a quite a surprise. I don't wanna give it all away. But by the way, Kennedy's only 45 years old. Um, talk about pressure. Uh, because a lot of the people are saying what you're doing is wrong about the blockade. Now you've alerted the Soviets that we know about the missiles, so you've taken away the element of surprise. An incident occurs on this sub. This is Soviet sub B-59. We had, by cable, we had told the Soviets if we detect a sub near the quarantine line, which was 500 miles in a perimeter around Cuba, we're gonna drop practice depth charges to let that sub commander know that we found him. And they have to come to the surface then move away. I don't think that information ever got to this commander because when the practice depth charges come down and the crew on board was later interviewed and they said it wasn't just one or two, it was many over the course of the afternoon. And they said, they thought they were real because they said it was like being inside a steel drum with somebody taking a sledgehammer to it. So the commander of B-59, he goes to his top three people, load the special torpedo in the firing tube. And 
what the special torpedo is, is the one torpedo he has on board that has a nuclear tip. He's prepared to, to fire a nuclear weapon because he thinks World War III is, has broken out. And you know, part of the reason, I guess, for the tension in the sub is I did a book called So Close to Home, and it's about the first U-boat that rounds the tip of Florida, goes all the way, you, this is a U-boat, German U-boat in World War II, goes all the way to the mouth of the Mississippi River and sinks a freighter that had a, a family on four on board, and it's their survival story. But I also followed what was happening on board the sub because I had the commander's war diary. And it was brutal conditions on these subs, and the Soviet subs weren't much better than the German U-boats from World War II. It was hot inside because of the batteries. Uh, on B-59, this Russian sub, they were running low on drinking water, so that was rationed. The uh, communications were, were difficult, and um, they were kind of out there uh, on their own under really trying conditions. And so they're in the process of loading the nuclear torpedo and thank God, by luck, this is total luck, on board this sub is a flotilla coordinator for the four Soviet Foxtrot subs that were near the quarantine line. And his name, I forget his first name, his last name is Arkhipov. This is him a few years later. Arkhipov goes to the commander you can't fire this torpedo. We don't know if World War III has broken out and we have not received permission from Moscow. And so they get in an argument and thank God Arkhipov talks this commander down off the ledge because I, I'm, I'm certain had he fired the nuclear torpedo, which would have taken out an aircraft carrier in the vicinity and, and battleships nearby, that would have triggered nuclear war. So if you boil the whole sequence of events down, if this one individual wasn't on that sub at that particular time, we probably would have been in nuclear war. That's, that's how scary this is. And some of the eyewitnesses on that sub years later uh, came forward and explained exactly how it all happened. So now we're gonna switch over to uh, Chuck Maltzby, the U-2 pilot. And at first, when you read about him, you'll go, what's his, what's his role in the Cuban Missile Crisis? He's stationed in Alaska. He's told during the crisis, and in, in no direct link to the crisis, but he's told, take a U-2 that's equipped with carbon paper that can get radioactive samplings over the North Pole because we wanna monitor, this is an ongoing program, what the Soviets are doing with their nuclear weapons. And there had been only one flight prior to his that goes all the way over the North Pole and then back again to Alaska. So it is a difficult flight, but he's a good, a good pilot. And you know, they thought of every contingency, you know, an escort part of the way where his last radio contact would be. But they, but they missed one, one kind of outlier, if you will, one factor they didn't anticipate. And that was the Northern Lights because there, there is no GPS in 1962. And, and at night you have to fly by celestial navigation by the stars compared to your own charts. Well, he can't see the stars. So he becomes disoriented and rightly so he aborts the mission. And now he's trying to figure out, I still can't see the stars. How do I get back to Eisen Air Force Base? So he left from position A, his last radio contact is B. It's up at C that he becomes disoriented by the Northern Lights. And then on his way back, he becomes lost and he strays over Russian airspace. And the Russians know he's there because again, their radar can pick up U-2s. They don't know what kind of aircraft this is, but they know it's not one of their own. So they think that maybe this is the vanguard of an American attack on the motherland. And the story just gets stranger and stranger. And I don't want to give it away, but it's like something out of a James Bond novel. The sequence of events between the Soviet fighter jets, 
between chuck maltzby being lost and running out of fuel he actually shuts the engine off thank god his pressure suit worked because uh the the atmosphere in the cockpit all of a sudden uh the pressure changed and it's just like you wouldn't believe the sequence of events and it, it almost triggers war as well it, it takes a while for this information to get back to kennedy but it, it eventually does reach him so now we switch gears to major rudy anderson he's down at mccoy in florida he volunteers to fly at the same time uh, that um, Chuck Maltzby is lost. He doesn't know Chuck's lost. They, they know each other, but they don't know what's going on with each other. So he's going to do a flight similar to uh, Jerry McElmore's. And he's in a US Air Force U-2. He uh, is being tracked by the Soviets. Two Soviet generals have a conversation, and one of them goes, and this is a direct quote, our guest has overstayed his welcome. Let's get permission to shoot him down. So they contact the Soviet Supreme Commander in Cuba and they cannot get a hold of him. He's really ill that night. And so they decide since they can't get a hold of him, they have the authority to make this decision. So they radio Bonnier's Cuba surface to air missile site. And it's a simple instruction. They, they've labeled this U-2 target number 33, and they just say, destroy target number 33. So they're making this unilateral decision without consulting Moscow, without getting the blessing of the, the Supreme Commander of Soviet forces in Cuba. They think they've got the power. And they, they rightly assume that, hey, it looks like war is going to break out on Sunday. This is happening Saturday. And their intelligence was good. It, it probably would have come on Sunday. So that flight uh, comes in the length of Cuba and um, Rudy's down past Guantanamo Bay when the Russians fire the missiles. And a lot of times the Cubans take credit for shooting down this aircraft, but the Cubans had no involvement with the surface to air missiles or the, the uh, intercontinental or ballistic uh, medium range ballistic missiles. So they fire. And now what happens next, I'm speculating a bit, but I don't believe it was a direct hit because I finally found a, a picture. And I, when I found the picture, I called Jerry McElmore and I said, Jerry, wouldn't, if a U-2 was hit directly, wouldn't it come down in a thousand little pieces because it's 13 miles high? And he said, yes. And I said, well, I found a picture of Major Anderson's U-2 on the ground and part of it's intact. And he said, Mike, that's because even if just one piece of shrapnel hits the U-2, it's probably going to be wounded. And I'll never forget, he described it in a good way. He said, a wounded U-2 is going to come down like a leaf spiraling from a tree in the autumn just slowly come down. He said, it's going to lose one wing, then another, then maybe the tail. And I said, Jerry, that's exactly what the picture shows that a Cuban took of Rudy's aircraft on the ground. You know, the wings, part of it is missing, part of the, the back of the U-2 is missing, but the main fuselage is intact and Major Rudy Anderson was dead inside. No evidence that he tried to put out a mayday, no evidence that he tried to eject um, because there, there was a, a way to, to eject and that was proven that it, it could survive by uh, Gary Powers. Um, and so interesting that everybody seems to know about Gary Powers, nobody seems to know about the death of Major Rudy Anderson. So back in Washington, for some reason the military decides not to tell Kennedy right away. They wait four hours. And then when they do tell him at the meeting, Bobby goes, what, what, what? Are you saying one of our pilots has been shot down and killed? And whoever it was, I think it was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs said, yes, sir. 
And Kennedy then goes, the president goes, well, this is a whole different ball game. And LeMay thinks, okay, I've got my jets in Key West, gassed up, ready to attack, as you promised. But Kennedy frustrates LeMay again, and he goes, not yet. And LeMay, when he leaves the room, goes, what a chicken. They killed one of our pilots, and he's still not doing anything. But back to Kennedy, he adjourns the meeting briefly, pulls Bobby aside, and he tells him to go to the Soviet foreign minister. And he says, he never uses the word ultimatum, but it's clear that's what he's doing. He says, tell them that military action is imminent unless you agree to this deal. And the deal is you have to remove and announce you're gonna remove your missiles out of Cuba. We will in turn promise not to invade the island. And on a side, private deal where that cannot be announced, I'll give you my word that I'll take our missiles out of Turkey at a later date, but that's going to take some time because of NATO. And it was interesting, Sergei Khrushchev told me as soon as my father was cabled with this offer, he jumped at the chance because he recognized the Chuck Maltzby incident, the B-59 sub incident, things are spiraling out of control. Um, Khrushchev never wanted nuclear war, just like Kennedy never wanted it. And he sees that they're, you know, they're on the doorstep. So he makes sure the quickest way to let the president know was he had Radio Moscow announce a deal has been reached. The crisis has been diffused. So LeMay was not happy. He thought we should have fought the Soviets, that this was the time to do it that our military was stronger, that we would win this war. He, LeMay later ran for vice president on the, the George Wallace ticket. That, that would have been a scary ticket. But the president goes on air and announces a deal has been reached. Um, there's never any gloating uh, on his part because one, he's keeping the Turkey deal under wraps and two, uh, the Soviets still have to remove these missiles. They might change their mind. So they've got to work with the UN to get those missiles out of there. But it, it all happens over, over a period of time, and we're monitoring it with our surveillance. And then the Soviets, three weeks later, re released the body of Major Anderson. And you'll, you'll read how tough it is on his wife and family. Um, I'll just tell you one brief story. A year before this terrible tragedy, she gets a knock on her door at the Del Rio Air Force Base, and it's the um, chaplain and you know one of the Air Force leaders, and they say, "Mrs. Anderson, your husband's been killed in a training accident." Well, the chaplain went to the wrong door. It wasn't her house. He was supposed to go to somebody else's. So now, a year later, she gets the knock on the door. He really is been killed in combat, and she doesn't know what to think. Uh, so she just goes through this nightmarish ordeal that the Air Force really did not help in any way. And, and then you'll see what the autopsy showed on, on Major Anderson and, and what I learned from interviewing Jerry McElmoyle because Rudy was his boss, so he, he was privy to the, what the autopsy showed. But Kennedy, I'm jumping ahead now, about a month after the crisis, he does something really that I thought was gracious, it takes time out from his busy schedule, flies to Florida to thank the pilots and the planners in person. And so Jerry goes to me, he goes, boy, was I excited I was gonna get to shake the president's hand. You know, here I am, a 33 year old pilot. And then uh, Major, whoever it is, you know, his boss, his new boss, because Major Anderson's been killed, goes, uh, sorry, Jerry, you're the rookie. You have to stay back with the aircraft in case somebody from the president's entourage wants to see what these YouTubers look like. So I decided to end the story with this, the book with this story, because it's a pretty cool little chain of events. So Jerry's in the hangar. He's up, you know, there's a bunch of steps that lead up to the cockpit. He's standing by the cockpit and he sees Kennedy's limo drive right into the hangar. He sees Kennedy get out. He hears Kennedy say to his group, you all stay 
in the limo, I want to talk to that young man privately. And he goes up the stairs and he has about a 15 minute private conversation with Jerry. So two combat veterans, just the two of them. And so I decided to end the book, what did Kennedy and Jerry talk about? Just these, these two men on their own that was never before recorded. So if you're interested in above and beyond about the Cuban Missile Crisis for a gift for the holidays, if you, if you order it by, through my website and I keep the prices competitive with Amazon, there's a way to tell me who to make the book out to if it's a gift. And also on the website are some of my other books, the, um, the U-Boat book about the U-Boat that comes by Florida, that's called So Close to Home. And um, a, a brand new book um, called The Waters Between Us. This is a memoir about growing up in Western Massachusetts and Vermont and uh, always being in trouble, always being in the outdoors and this fractured relationship with my father and what, what changes that relationship. So while the first half of the book is kind of laugh out loud, like Bill Bryson's A Walk in the Woods, the second half gets kind of deep. And um, also on the website is, lately I've been doing books for uh, middle readers. So that'd be age eight to 14 and they're called the True Rescue Series. So they're mostly like the finest hours as part of the True Rescue Series. So they're adult books that have been adapted for middle readers and they're the most, kind of the most fast paced books and they all involve rescue and, and survival. And that's what the kids seem to like and particularly uh, fast paced books because they all have been selected by Scholastic as uh, Scholastic School Reads. But I, uh, I dedicated the book to Jerry and, and sadly, Jerry passed away a few months back. Um, it looks like he could be my father in this picture. We became close friends and um, he was just very gracious as was his wife, welcoming me into their home several times because I would pick his brain trying to get the feel of what it would be like to be flying a U-2, what it must have been like for Rudy Anderson to maybe see or maybe not even see those missiles coming up at him. Um, because I've never been in a U-2 and um, probably never will be, and certainly will never be flying in one. Uh, but Jerry had hundreds of flights. And so we dedicated the book to, to Jerry the pilots that volunteered, put their lives on the line, and to Major Rudy Anderson, the one, the one pilot who, who gave his life during the Cuban Missile Crisis that at time seems to have overlooked. So I'm gonna stop the screen share and I'd be happy to take questions or, or comments. The, um, the book, uh, it, it kind of builds, I would say, um, where the um, where in the beginning, you know, we open it with a bang, but then we want to give you a little bit of a lead up to the Cuban Missile Crisis. Like, why were we remiss in discovering the nuclear missiles until ten days before they were ready to be launched? So there is a build up, but the bulk of the book is about the thirteen days. Are there any questions, Deb, in the chat room? Or if somebody wants to unmute themselves, that's fine too. I, I can't see all the, the faces on board. Michael, that was fascinating. So interesting Thank and you. so much. I think um, we are all digesting at the moment, but <laughs> it's gonna start, start coming. Um, I'm interested because I'm not in that era. My dad was, and I think he's on the program today. Do people of that time know about Major Anderson? Was that ever in the news? It, you know, believe it or not, I, I had to look. Is it in like, because I live outside of Boston, is it in the Boston Globe? And sure enough, there was a little, you know, maybe three lines. Yes, one of our YouTube pilots was shot down and killed. So it was in the news, but no, nobody seems to know about it. Um, and I I guess because the 
the bigger issue was it went on to, oh my God, the blockade and the Russians and it, will Sunday be the start of World War III? Because I never knew it. You know, that's what attracted me to this topic, you know, publicizing his sacrifice. Right. Wow. So many things in there. We were that close. We were that close. And it makes me wonder, are we that close today? Could screw ups or miscommunications cause the same type of events? I, I don't know. Right. Uh, Jerry said there's been some improvements because he was later as Brigadier General uh, involved with our nuclear weapons arsenal. Um, he thought things had improved in terms of safety, safety. But, but I'm not so sure. <laughs> I know that the uh, the hotline was installed by Kennedy after he realized we were that close and there was no way to get to Khrushchev immediately. Everything was done through, you know, cables and back channels. And, and they actually had a thaw in their relationship. So who knows what might have happened between the two countries had Kennedy not been assassinated. Um, yeah. Yeah, after this incident, they were talking more. Things are starting to look up. We have a question and a comment from Pat. I remember going to school one day during my sophomore year and really thinking Long Island, New York area was going to be bombed from Cuba that day, but it didn't happen. Which day would that have been? Well, we, we were talking about an attack on that Sunday or Monday after Black Saturday. So um, I forget the date of Black Saturday, but that next day or the day after, and if, if the Soviets wanted to, they could have uh, attacked then. Um, we also didn't know that there were about 40,000 forces, Soviet forces on Cuba, and they had some tactical nuclear weapons on the island. So any invasion that we would have launched would have been really costly. Um, so all this information came out much later uh, McNamara, for example, he went to this summit conference with some of the Soviet leaders and they talked about it. And when it was over, he said to the press, I had no idea just how close we were. Mm -hmm. I knew we were close, he said, but I learned we were even closer. How were the tapes released? Uh, I'm not sure. That's a good question. Um, maybe through the, you know, the Kennedy Center, but um, I did find listening to them was really difficult. And if you were to go through like the walking tour of the, the Kennedy Center in Boston, you could listen to a little of it. Uh, you can even find a little of it online if you, if you Google it. But, but the Kennedy tape book was the source that I went to where it says who sang what and at what time. So you see that exchange. Uh, you see like LBJ, he didn't say much when Kennedy was in the room, but when Kennedy wasn't in the room, then he spoke up, which was kind of odd. Um, so I did enjoy reading the book. I don't, I don't know if they, you know, the person with a casual interest in the Cuban Missile Crisis would, would want to read that, that big, thick book, because mm -hmm. uh, some of it's redundant. But we put the, the more uh, heated exchanges in Above and Beyond. Cricket wants to know, any knowledge of test flights beforehand to test the cameras? As a kid, Navy pilots at Mayport later told us flights with explosive lights at night over our homes in Jacksonville Beach were a run up to the actual photo flights. That, that makes sense. Um, Cause yeah, there, there had to be all sorts of testing and I'm not as familiar with like the Navy Crusaders and some other reconnaissance aircraft as I am with the U-2, but we had, we had pretty much perfected the U-2's photography. <laughs> Again, the one weakness was it couldn't penetrate cloud cover. Interesting though, this is just a little aside and it could be out of date, but every year it seems like since I got into this subject, I read, oh, the Air Force is gonna retire the U-2. And then at the last minute they say, no, we're gonna keep a couple operational. And I don't know why we have satellites, but I, I think that there's still some U-2s in operation. Um, maybe because they can stay over a target as long as, as they need to. Wow. 
Thank you. Thank you. We have a message from, hmm, I can't see the whole thing. Just one second here. I was 13 years old at that time and my father immediately began to build our civil defense bomb shelter. It was fully stocked with food, toilet paper, sterno candles and flashlights. We three children were afraid of what we would find when it was over and we exited. I'm sorry, I can't read the rest of that. Can you please finish that baby Ruth? <laughs> Wait, I got on here. Oh, when we exited the bomb shelter, we, we were so afraid after it was over, what are we gonna, what's gonna be out there? Is, is everything gonna be annihilated? We were really afraid, but daddy uh, allayed our fears, everything would be okay. Of course, you know, we're young children. And, uh, but anyway, and he was a 33 year Navy veteran. So, but it was, uh, it was really some, something to be afraid of. You stayed in it, you were in it? What's that? You stayed in, in the shelter? Well, we went down there and played in it, you know, yeah. because we just we were trying to pretend and think what would happen. But you know, it was uh, it was there for many many years. Wow. Yeah, they 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 were selling out of these, you know, um, pre-made bomb shelters. You just had to dig the hole, and then they drop this small canister in. Um, but yeah, I've heard a lot of scary, scary stories from, from people who remember it well. Yeah, Daddy built it himself. He, uh, he built it brick by brick, uh, well, cinder block by cinder block for the uh, five of us. But I always thought it's so small in here. How are we going to manage and how long will we be in here? <laughs> right. And how do you get fresh air? And will the air be breathable? Um, yeah, he had some vent holes to the outside because it was in the basement in his workshop and there were vent holes to the outdoors. But of course, we didn't know any of the threats, the radioactivity, et cetera. James sent a, a nice comment. This was a fascinating presentation. Well done. I was oh, in elementary school in Jacksonville, Florida during the Cuban Missile Crisis. It was a scary time. Thank you, James. I can imagine Jacksonville must have been a beehive of military activity because every all the troops were coming down into Florida you know this was going to be ground zero for the launch um, but uh, boy I, I sure hope that some of our leaders one read this book to see how close we came and two see how Kennedy you know made the decisions very deliberately having learned from screwing up during the, the uh, Bay of Pigs um, so that's why I said the Bay of Pigs may have been a blessing. He didn't just go along with the hotheads in the room on the first day, even though he was leaning that way. All right, everybody, thank you so much for joining. And Michael, we uh, are so honored to have you and appreciate all of your knowledge um, and, help and helpfulness on this subject. I hope to have you back. And now that you're in Florida, maybe we'll uh, have you in the library and, and I'm sure you'll be out on the circuit. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be fun to meet you in person. And thank you everyone for coming. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Enjoy your day. Enjoy, you too. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.